on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. Luckily, I was fooling around, I guess, with all of these stories. So I figured, you know what, let's take a shot at this. Assuming, like most people, that it would be real easy to get real famous <laughs> making books, I was really wrong. <laughs> Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It is The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Uh, here we are again, Mark. We're doing a little bit of batch recording this week. And uh, I did mention at the end of last week's episode that we are planning to open ads for authors in August now that the live show is out of the way. So if you have thought about uh, ads for authors, um, we'll give you a little bit more information over the next few weeks and uh, in order for you to make a good decision for you and your career. Um, now, we have an interview today with somebody who sells books in a slightly different way. We've had a few of these actually. I've done a lot of interviews recently. And I uh, did an interview this week with uh, an author, a spicy romance author, who basically sells by subscription uh, via Patreon. It's a big part of her income, how she started. This author is something we have heard before. People like Karen Ingalls, who's a children's author here in the UK. But Daniel Jude Miller is somebody who sells the majority of his books via school visits. And this is not just a little bit extra on top of his book sales. This is how he drives book sales. He's very organized about it. He says there's an entire ecosystem for authors uh, to plug into once they uh, they understand how it works. It's a really interesting interview, particularly if you're a children's author. Mark, I know you are a children's author now. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. So I have my second book uh, in the After School Detective Club series published, uh, well, yesterday as we record this, but as this goes out a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I, I have done school visits um, and Alan Burroughs, who I work on the series with, it also has done more school visits than me. But I just know from my own experience at World Book Day, um, did a couple of schools, my daughters and uh, the, a school of a teacher who has a, uh, her child is in my daughter's class. And I think in, in, in those two uh, sessions, probably sold 60 books. So, yeah. you know, it's, you, you can definitely do it. So, I mean, if... Um, you know, the, the maths ha have to add up um, and you're going to make more money if you are selling your own books, probably, than, than these are these are from a publisher. So it's just a little bit different in terms of how, how the, the uh, economics work out. But you definitely can um, sell uh, a lot of books to kids uh, at those events, especially if you sign them afterwards, which is what I did. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's definitely uh, it's a good tactic. Yeah. OK, well, let's listen to the detail of how that works, particularly in the US. This is in the greater New York area. Let's listen to Daniel Jude Miller. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Daniel Jude Miller, uh, very formal announcement. Welcome to the self-publishing show. Uh, a man, if you're watching the YouTube feed, uh, I can see straight away a man of many baseball caps. Yes, too many, as my wife would say. 300-odd, <laughs> you say, you've collected? 323 Major League Baseball hats. Never been worn, actually. Only one of them has ever been worn. The first one I bought when I was in the fourth grade. All the rest, brand new. And how complete, sorry, this is a sideline, but I'm fascinated. How complete is that collection? I mean, have you got every cap, every, every cap, every franchise has released? No, not every single one, because also they release new ones every year, so they make you keep buying. Um, I'm probably around 40 shy of a complete collection. So I guess someone somewhere, maybe it's you, keeps a, a list, a publicly available list of every cap, a central repository of information. Well, you'd be surprised. There's actually a whole community of people um, who have it. There are people with bigger collections than mine. Um, and yeah, that you can find that easily online. People that have a whole bunch of lists of all the different hats and, you know, and again, you can never complete it because every year they come out with 10 or 12 more. Yeah. So you're always chasing it. Yeah. Well, I've got one Mets cap, I think somewhere, <laughs> somewhere but, uh, from when we went, but okay. All right. Well, let's move on from caps. So it's fascinating. It's a great shop, by the way, on YouTube. So thank you. We are going to be talking about uh, children's books, illustrating in particular, uh, and I know children's books is such an interesting area and we get lots and lots of questions about the methodology, the marketing, the process for children's books, which is quite different from uh, fiction and non-fiction books. 
But let's start with you, Jude. I think you began as an illustrator. Is that right? Uh, I actually began as a kid who liked to draw because it actually goes all the way back to that. Um, I was the kid in school that was always drawing and, and I had one singular goal was to become an artist. I, I never I never had any inkling of doing books. That was never my plan. Um, I wanted to be an animator when I was younger. And then I realized back in the day, animation was really difficult. Um, it's not as, as computer friendly as it is now. It was a lot of drawing. So I, I bailed on animation and I decided to just go into editorial illustration. And that was the plan. Like, you know, I never when I was. 30 years old, I still had no interest in books whatsoever. I didn't want to illustrate other people's stories. And I did definitely didn't want to write my own. I was t totally fine uh, just doing editorial magazine, boring illustration. When you talk about editorial illustration, can you give me any sort of example of what that is? Uh, that's basically magazines, newspapers, advertisements. I was I was a cartoonist at a PR firm, and I would just do literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these really boring cartoons about uh, insurance or about medicine. And that's actually what ended up. It was actually for the best because it was so boring that after like twelve years of it, I just needed something else, and that's how I accidentally fell into writing. Okay, so you what, what did you have the idea that you obviously you had the ability to illustrate a children's book and you just mm, thought, yes. well, I'm going to learn how to write it. Was that the process? It, it's funny because I there was no formal like process at, at, at that time when I had that boring job. I I was I guess I it was like a. Uh, a writer on the inside, but I never, I never thought it was real. I would, I would always just kind of write stories. And I, since I did the illustrations myself, I would do the, all the work. I would sketch it out. I would do all these dummies, but I never planned on officially sending it to anyone or making it. It was almost like I had a hobby as a writer and a children's illustrator, but I had a job as an editorial illustrator. And then one day, like that job just went away. And you, you find yourself looking in the mirror and going, what am I going to do? Um, and I said, you know what, may I'll try to actually publish these things because there was a lot of them. I had actually written about six or seven books with no plan on ever publishing them. And I thought, well, I might as well take a shot at it now. And how complete were they? You'd written them, illustrated them, put them together in a kind of formatted sense. Or were these just rough notes you had? They were pretty complete. Um, they they were fully written and they had even gone through the process of, you know, the family and friend editing. Um, so they were they were pretty complete. And they at least as far as the drawings go, they were up to the sketched out dummy stage. So they needed to be finished, which is the hardest part. But they were pretty far along. So that's when so the moment that I decided I was going to do this business. I was able to produce like three books within like a year because I had done all the preliminary work and it was just sitting on my computer. I actually remember once going into just for myself, I went into Staples and I had them print out my dummies so that I could see it in sort of a book form. And I remember the guy saying to me, you know, are you a writer? And I said, no. And I said, this is just for me. Like I had no plan on ever sending it to anyone. And two years later, it was officially published. And how did that happen? Well, what happened was that job, thankfully, went away. And like I said, I, I needed to do something. And so there were there were choice. There weren't a lot of choices because where I was living at the time, the, the editorial job I had was in New York City. And so at some point they let me take my job home and ro work remote. This is before everybody worked remote. And so I moved to the country. The problem is when that job went away. There weren't a lot of art jobs where where I now live. And so I had to figure something out on my own. So luckily, I was fooling around, I guess, with all of these stories. So I figured, you know what, let's take a shot at this. Assuming like most people that it would be real easy to get real famous <laughs> making books. I was really wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as a lot of us find out, there's a grind involved in that. But you've obviously gone down that route. And, and how have you produced? Are you using print on demand services? No, I, I decided I was going to go all in and I was going to invest a lot of money in it. And so I actually right off the bat, um, I know now I let's let's put this into context. This was about five or six years ago when I started at that time, the print on demand wasn't as good as it is now. It's gotten better. Um, but I like I wanted to do go all out. You know, I wanted to do hardcover. Most print on demand is soft cover. I know now they, they do do hardcover. I wanted dust jackets. I wanted all the bells and whistles that you would see on a book in bar, you know, in a 
bookstore. And so at the time, the, the only way to really do that was to go all in. So I just invested a ton of money, which probably wasn't brilliant at the time because I had no job, but, but I, I invested a whole bunch of money and we ordered thousands and thousands of units of multiple books because since I was able to finish a few at the same time, um, I had to order all of them. So I was heavily invested on day one. And then what did you do with them in terms of distribution? Okay, so th that's where it gets interesting. So I assumed, like everyone does in the beginning, that I was going to just put them up on Amazon and be famous by the end of the month. And that is totally not true. It's not even close, actually. Um, I think I sold a handful of books and, and I was really in a spot because now I had invested literally on upwards of almost $20,000 and I had no sales and no plan, apparently. So my wife had actually said she found a book show it wasn't too far from, from our house. And she said, let's do this book show and see what happens. And at the book show, there was another, there was only four authors there. It was more like a children's festival. And there was four authors. One of them was, was a guy named Gary Van Riper. And I had done some research on him and found out that he had at the time sold like 150,000 books self-published. So I made it a point that I needed to talk to him to figure out how he was doing it. I went up to the show. I sold a grand total of 10 books that day, which it was not a, a raving success, but I did talk to him and he, and he took a liking to me and he said, how do you plan on selling your books? And I said, probably on Amazon. He said, no, he said, you have to do school visits. That's what you should be doing. And I had no idea what that was. I didn't, I never even heard of it. And he said, come with me. I have one like next week, you can shadow me and, and I'll show you how we do it. I went there and I just fell in love with the idea of not only making children's books, but actually getting up in front of the audience and explaining how I do it and, and why I do it and all that stuff. So the best part of the job for me is actually that part. Yeah. So that's obviously part of your strategy now. And you, you just say your books are aimed at what grade level, what age? Well, Luckily, mine are spread out. I have uh, two books that are for nursery school through about second grade. Then I have two, uh, a, a couple of books that are for like second grade to like fourth or fifth. And then now over the summer, um, I have a middle grade novel coming out. So that'll span all the way up to about seventh or eighth grade. So I actually, that's what helps me at schools too, is that my work spans all the way from kindergarten all the way up to their oldest students. So I have a lot of things I can talk about. Yeah. So you go and do the school visits. First of all, how do you get school? visits how do you get on that that rotor well the the funny part is is the real story is when i shadowed uh him at that school visit i watched him do it and i was in my head i was thinking there's no chance that i can do this right it was a room full of 300 kids that's not me right and right at the moment when i'm thinking that i hear him say i brought a friend with me today and i'm thinking who else did he bring right not thinking it's me and so he brings me up and, I, and he asked me one simple art question. And I don't remember what it was because my hand was shaking because I, I had never thought that this was going to happen. And I, I got in the car and I said to my wife, I called her up. I said, forget it. I said, this school thing ain't going to work. It's not going to happen. And she said, it better happen because we have a basement filled with books. So you better figure this out. And so actually what happened is I took the whole summer. It was, it was luck that it was June at the time and the school year was ending. So I had spent the whole summer building a curriculum now of what I want to talk about and how I can inspire these kids. So I had a few months to do it. And then in September, I just started calling and emailing wherever I could find. And it works. You know, they, they most schools annually host an author. And so I just reached out to a lot of different people. And then the funny part is my first author visit, I was nervous on the drive over there, but then they handed me the microphone and I have never been nervous ever since it just never affected. Did you practice your presentation in the summer to the mirror or to your wife? Or? I tried. Okay. But what, what, so I thought I had actually written it out as a script and I had written line by line and I, I was trying to memorize um, the script. But what I found was that once you're in the room, people always ask me, they go, do, do you get nervous like getting up in front of these big crowds? And I said, no. And they're like, what if you make a mistake? I'm like, you can't because it's my life and there, there's nothing I can make a mistake, but I'm not going to forget where I went to school or where I got an idea from. So I tried to memorize it, but it turned out I didn't have to. Once I was in front of the room, you, you can kind of do it because it's just your life. So you know how to tell that story. And so you're now doing this. Is that the primary way you're selling your books? 
Yeah, it's it's probably about 95%. Like, cause it's, you know what it is? It's so time consuming between the marketing. Like you have to pick where you put your time. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to sell online, then you got to focus on that. But between the marketing for schools, between the traveling for schools, between, you know, I have to deal with projects and after school things and, and all that goes around it and updating the program and physically doing the, pro- I mean, yet yesterday was a presentation day for me virtually. I was on the computer for four hours doing four presentations. That doesn't leave a whole lot of time to focus in another area like, like online sales. So Luckily, my sales through schools are perfectly fine, exactly what I want. And so I kind of just focused on that area. And how do the sales come about? Is it there? Because children don't generally carry like 10 bucks with them to school. <laughs> is it it's not there and then or is it in the days afterwards or? So I do it different than most other authors do it. I, I like most other authors do their sales bef- the day, uh, that day. So they, they basically pre-sell them. So they'll have the, the students send in their money in advance and then they'll sign books that day and they'll, you know, they'll sell them that day. I, I don't like to do that for a few reasons. Number one, out of respect for the parents, I like the students to meet me first before I sell them anything. It's also good for me because if they've met me, that makes them want it more as opposed to them not knowing who I am. And then they don't know if they want it. Also, if I if I sell it after my event, then it frees up time during the day that I don't have to sign books. I can ship them. So it gives me more time during the day to eat lunch with the kids or answer questions. So basically that day when I come to the school, I'll bring order forms with me and they go home after the event. They return them back to the teachers at some point about a week later, and then the teachers, you know, collect it all, send it to me, and I ship out the books that way. And we we all work on conversion percentages when we work online. You know, mm-hmm. old numbers are big, hundred thousand here, five percent conversion. When you've got a room of a hundred kids, what's what's a good conversion rate for you for orders afterwards? Now it'll go all over the place because, and there's no way to. I've tried and tried to figure it out. You could go to a really, really small rural school and expect sales to be not good, and they can be amazing. You can go to schools in really good neighborhoods where you expect sales to be great, and they're not good because you're dealing with a lot of factors of how the teachers are promoting it, you know, how engaged the parent body is. But in general, on if uh, the number that I go by that I can kind of predict is I can convert probably 20% of the room. So now the average school in, in that I go to is roughly around 400 students is the average. So I can easily move 80 to 100 books in an afternoon. Now it's possible I could do more. I've done, I, I forgot what my record is. I think it's like 175. Um, there's other times that you'll do not very many. Now, another point is I'm also getting paid to be there, which is like, right. so the minute I walk in the door, I've already made money and I, and they pay relatively well. So even if I sold zero books, it's not even close to a loss. If I sell books, I always look at it this way. Uh, the, the person that Gary Van Riper, who trained me, he said, don't really focus on the book sales because they're going to be up and down and you'll drive yourself crazy. Just come up with a system, follow that system and focus on the presentations because that's the pro- my primary function is to educate these kids and inspire them. I almost look at the books as the souvenir that they get to buy on their way out. And is this something that works for younger children with children's books or could adult fiction authors go in as a thriller author and talk to older? Is this, is this a tried and tested thing in the States for old, uh, you know, older age level? I don't. Okay. So it, for elementary level, which here is, is from uh, kindergarten to about sixth, that's what is elementary here. Probably 70% of the schools in America do this every single year. So they have to find someone. Okay. Usually the 30% they're not doing it. It's just a budget issues that they just, they want to do it, but they just can't, they can't find the funding. Um, so there are a lot of authors and this is a totally pos- possible way to make a living. That's I'm doing it. Um, once you pass the sixth grade, it gets a little more difficult, okay, because the students change, all right? So when, like, I, they use this example. When I go into a classroom of first graders and I ask, how many of you like to draw? Literally every single hand will go up. If I do that in fifth grade, 50% of the hands will go up. If I do that in eighth grade, I'll get three real shy hands that don't even want to admit that they like to draw. Yeah. So that's the problem. It gets harder to do the school's. For me, I can do some of the older kids because I have a different presentation about um, 
about more about motivation and them finding what their dreams are, even if it's not writing and drawing. But once you get to high school is where it starts to break down. So it would be tough for someone that's not somewhat student. Uh, the work isn't student geared. If you get to adult type books, then it gets real hard, especially once you get up to those teenagers. Yeah. Now, I think you're in the New York area. I can tell from your accent. I think you must be. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> do, I, do I have a little bit of an accent? <laughs> a little bit of an accent there. It sounds like I'm watching a, 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 a drama uh, on Netflix. Um, yeah, no, a great accent actually for New York. So I guess you're in the metropolitan yes. area there somewhere. Um how how much do you travel? I mean, I guess New York has like a gazillion schools. So that's good for a start. And the pupils change every year. But you, at some point, do you travel elsewhere? Is it worth it? Worth your while doing that? Okay, so I, I grew up in New York City. I spent like my whole life there. I worked in the Empire State Building. Then when I wanted to have a family, I left. Right. So I actually I live in New York State still, but I'm about three hours away um, from the city. Now that okay. doesn't mean anything because I'm back and forth all the time. Um, so my range is the three states that are around me. So I'd like put it in mileage is that I'm, I'm around about, about 300 miles is about as far as I'll go driving. Now, usually I try to stack um, events. Like if I'm going to go real far, then you try to put two or three days worth of events together. That's usually not too hard to do because schools usually, uh, districts usually have more than one building. So you can kind of book out a few days. Um, and, and, but I'll, anything within that 300 miles, I, I try to shy away from trips that involve flying, um, from a couple of reasons. Number one, it takes up more time because there's more traveling time that's eaten up. And second of all, it makes it really expensive, um, for the school. And I would actually rather they find someone that's closer to them to save them. There's plenty of authors out there. Um, I'll do it if they insist, but it doesn't seem like it to me, it's very cost effective. And like you said, I'm in New York state and Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. There's a lot of people here. There's yeah. a lot of schools. I'll never be able to do them all. So I don't need to go to California if I don't have to. Yeah. I mean, I suppose you could do like a tour, but it'd be very um hard work for you to, where you do like three three talks a day if you could coordinate it fly into la and do three talks a day for 10 days and then split the airfare around but yeah anyway you don't need to because there's all these schools there and you're not running out of schools and like i say by the time you got to the last school all the pupils would have changed at the first school so do you find obviously it sounds to me like you find it pretty easy to get booked um, it's, you know, it's work. It's like everything else, you know, it's, it's a constant marketing system. And um, like you, what you, to your point, you said about uh, the students rotating, I can usually go back in three years. So I don't have to wait for the entire school to change over because um, as long as they've moved up, like I said, my books are in different age ranges and also I'm coming out with new work. So then usually within about three years, I have a completely different presentation. So then I, I can go back. Um, the other invention is that I, I actually didn't want to do, but I kind of steered uh, shied away from virtual visits. I just assume kids are on the computer enough and the thing of meeting an author is more valuable than seeing them on, on a screen. And then uh, this, this thing happened and kind of wrecked the world. And the next thing I know, I wasn't allowed into school buildings anymore. And so I, there was no alternative. And so then I, I started, I was doing tons and tons of virtual. So I technically do do schools in California and Texas and all over the country, but those are done virtually because it's, it's less expensive. If they really want to have me, then we could do it that way. And if, if you want me to be in person, then usually I try to stay within that, that sort of three or four hour drive range. But you know what it is? There's so many schools and I can only do so many in a year. You know, I, I try to stay to around 50 in person and about 20 virtuals because that's 70 days worth of work. And that doesn't sound like a busy schedule, but I also have to write, I have to draw, I have to do my own website. I have to all these other jobs. If I'm on the road all the time, then there would be no new books. Yeah. That's, I guess that's one of the side effects of the pandemic is that the, we have a generation of kids who are quite happy or quite used to sitting in front of a screen and having an online lesson would have been slightly odd for our generation but um okay well let's talk about the illustrating and the writing um do you have a particular illustrating style that you that's unique to you that you developed as a kid and maybe got a bit um uh, i don't know what the word is but when you're working in the corporate world got a bit suppressed is the word i'm looking for but is there something that that is your brand it's kind of funny. It's, it's like the opposite of what, what you're saying. Okay. So like I started out like most kids, like I liked drawing cartoons and superheroes and things that normal kids like to draw. 
but I was really good at drawing. So you, when you're good at it, they start kind of pushing you to do more realistic things. And so when I went to art school, which was my, my goal, and I, I went to art school in Manhattan, in New York City, and I was super intent on being the most realistic artist um, there ever was. And I was pretty good at it, painting and life drawing and all that stuff. And then um, I was just talking about this out of school. They asked me, why do I draw the way I do now? Because I draw cartoons now. So they're like, how did you get there? And I said, well, I was in art school, very good at drawing. And then uh, I had a girlfriend and she dumped me and it broke my heart. So for a month, I didn't draw at all. And when I came out of that sort of sadness, I ditched all the realistic drawings. So she was responsible for completely shifting my style back to what it was when I was a kid. I went back to drawing cartoons and, and, and you know, more fun things. And then I got really good at that. And then I got that editorial job. And what happened was they needed cartoons, but they needed sort of corporate cartoons. So what happened is they kind of messed up my style and it wasn't, it was still cartoonish, but it wasn't good. So then finally, when I, that job went away, when I started doing books, it took a little while to find my sort of, you know, a visual voice again. But yes, I, I started with cartoons and I ended up with cartoons uh, or I should say a cartoonish style. It's not really cartoons. People think like newspaper cartoons then, but it's more like a, an animated movie type style. But in the middle, it was very serious. So or, or the opposite of amuse your girlfriend, she left and then that inspired <laughs> you to finish something. And uh, how does that story about your girlfriend dumping you go down with the, uh, with pre, you know, young children. What's funny is I, I've, I never use, like I have all this material that I, that I use, right. And I pull from my own experiences, things that I see at the schools that never came up. But remember we were just talking about the older kids yeah. and it was only about a month ago. And the teacher asked me, she said how, the same question you asked, how did you end up with the style you have? And I said, ah, oh, you don't really want to know. Cause it was, it was mostly seventh and eighth graders. And they were like, no, tell us for real. So I was like, all right, I'll try it. So I told the, the true story and they loved it because they were they were older kids. Then the teacher made me tell that story literally like eight times throughout the rest of the day. So I, I don't use that one when I'm talking to like second graders. But if they're older, they kind of understand. They just be going, oh, girls, uh, boyfriend. <laughs> you're right. Um, uh, your, your star. So I'm looking at one or two of the frames now and uh they're very distinctive. In fact, it reminds me in the UK, people will know what I'm talking about. There was a cartoon uh, cartoon uh, um, illustrator called Giles who did these very busy family scenes, very unique. And he died a few years ago, but um, quite famous in the UK. And you're, you're reminiscent of that. Although the big eyes also remind me almost an anime influence, maybe. Uh, I, I get asked this a lot. I, so I don't really know where the big eyes came from. Um, but yeah, like, and, and I'll have to look up the Giles because I've, I've, yeah, I'm curious. Yeah, if, I can, if I can find some stuff, I'll send you some links. I think you'd appreciate seeing them. Um, they, I grew up with them in the gun. Any, anyone from the UK about my age will know exactly what I'm talking about. Very, very distinctive. So I can see um, kids being drawn to this because they're incredibly infectious illustrations. There's so much to look at, so much character uh, in the drawings. And I guess... You use shade and light, I think, very well to to keep the eyes focused on the main parts of the story. But in the background, there's a whole set of stuff that you could examine. So each frame must take you. I don't know. How long does a frame take you? Uh, well, each page takes about, I would say, it once I know what I'm going to do. OK, so the whole sketching process, who knows? Like, Because you could go through multiple variations. You can get it on the first try. Um, once I know what's going on this page, just the process of doing that final drawing and coloring it is about about a week and a half it'll take. And it's funny you point out the backgrounds because that's my least favorite thing right. to do. You know, I love drawing characters and, and everybody, I'm sure most illustrators do, but they have to exist in an environment. And so I, I'm forced to do backgrounds and I'm glad everyone likes them, but that is my least favorite part to do. It's funny because I think your backgrounds are really great. Oh, <laughs> thank really, you. Really make the frame. Uh, for the YouTube version, we'll put one or two of these up as we're talking about them. Um, in terms of the themes, I always often wonder about children's because teachers go through teacher training college, right? They go, they do a degree, then they have a couple of intensive years learning about the psychology of children, how to talk to them, what's appropriate. Child writers come from none of that training background. And I doubt you have that background and you sit there and suddenly you're creating material for children. How do you get the pitch right? How do you get the language right? 
again, that's an excellent question. And I, I actually wish I had an excellent answer <laughs> because the truth is I don't think about it. Like I, I really don't. I was, I was meeting with students yesterday and somebody asked me, they, they asked in a, a, a child way, they said, do you ever like get criticized? Like, how do you deal with criticism? And I said, I don't think about it. Like I, I write the books I want to write. Okay. So some of my books, the vocabulary is probably at a higher level than the, who I'm aiming for, but I consider that a good thing. Okay. I want them, I want them to be challenged. Um, as far as subject matter goes, um, I don't think too much about it. I just, I write the story I want to write. Now there's a few, I, I go through a small focus group of students that I know. So I'll kind of feel them out. Um, it's funny you said about the boyfriend and girlfriend thing, because there's a book I'm working on and I show it in process at the presentations and in the one uh, drawing, the, 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 the woman gets married. And so there's a, there's a drawing of them kissing at the wedding. And every time I show it, they're grossed out like second yeah. and third graders. So by doing that process of, I, a lot of times I'll let, I'll show the work I'm doing to at schools so I can kind of gauge what they like and they don't like. So that drawing will not make the final, the final book because I'm getting feedback that they don't like that. But ultimately uh, I have no training on any of that stuff. And I kind of just use, it's kind of awesome because I get paid to go to schools they allow me to sell books. They're also giving me a focus group, right? So that I'm allowed to test ideas on the, on the students. And then also I get treated like a rock star, right? To boot, right? So like at the end of the day, you couldn't have asked for anything better. No, they do sound great. Do you deal with themes? Do you, do you write a book and think I'm going to deal with bullying in here or kind of the, or, or drugs or whatever? You might, might be a bit young for your, your audience. Do you decide to do something semi-educational like that? No. In fact, I try to get as far away from that stuff as possible because there is a general movement now that most people that are doing children's books, it's focusing a lot on these things. It's focusing a lot on encouraging uh, children to be unique and encouraging them to make good choices. And that, that, is a, that is a big market. The truth is, is that, first of all, it's a saturated market, so I don't want to compete in there. And second of all, I, I think sometimes people forget that kids, they just want to read a story. Yeah. Sometimes there doesn't need to be a moral necessarily. So, I mean, a lot, I mean, I literally am working on a book called uh, the boy made of boogers. Okay. There is no moral to the story. He's just made of boogers and they can't figure out why. And he's, he's different than everyone, but there won't be uh, a moral. It'll, and it's just meant to be funny and fun because they're kids, right? Sometimes they need a break from like all the uh, adult sort of pushing, uh, sensibilities on them yeah well that sounds great i think it's a it's a perfect uh, way of doing it now i guess the downside of you it sounds like a brilliant way of selling books because you thought you seem to enjoy it and i think you i can imagine you're great uh, in school for the kids memorable days for them and you're selling your books through that the downside i suppose is your online presence means that you don't see rank for any of those books that you sell you don't get the visibility the old amazon algorithm doesn't notice that you're selling those books because it's all happening offline but that's like you say time for you, you've only got so many hours in the day. Right. So yeah, no, none of that is, is anything associated with me. Now, in order, if I do want to go in that direction, and, and I do, right, obviously I need uh, an online presence also, I, I need staff. Okay. And that's because I can't possibly, I mean, right now we're launching, uh, I say we, but it's just me and my wife, but we're launching a whole YouTube channel because that's where kids are. Okay, social media, they're not on Facebook, they're not on Twitter, they're not on any of these things, but they are on YouTube. Okay, and so now we're launching a whole series of how you can, how you make books, basically my presentation, but in, in a chopped up form so that they can watch it on their own. That's a lot of work, like filming all of these, I do all my own editing. So for now, I want to have a bigger presence there. And then eventually I'm going to need to hire someone to handle all the online sales. Cause the truth is, is, is like, I've spent so much time learning the ins and outs of the schools and how they get funding and how you, you know, where, how they do the equipment that you need to do the presentations that I do. I know very little about Amazon advertising and algorithms because I just haven't spent any time on it. Yeah. Do you um, think that at some point you might animate your books? We talk about YouTube. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, like I said, when I was when I was in college, actually, I wanted to be an animator. But back then you had to do everything drawing. It was more drawing, drawing, drawing. It was a lot of drawing to animate. So I kind of soured on it. Now, animation is way easier with the programs that they have. Um, 
I maybe one day kids always ask me, will I ever turn anything into a movie? I don't know about a movie, but the thing is, is that I, I would love to learn how to do is just enough animation to use it for these videos and just sort of enhance the things that I already have. Um, but again, it always really comes down to time. You know, there's a, a lot. I mean, I, my website is enormous because I want it to be sort of a playground for kids. And so, I mean, my, my website has over 90 pages on it and it's all sorts of projects and games and things for them to look at and read. That's all me. Like I manage my own website. I'm designing it. I'm building out a whole new section now. So I have like a lot of different jobs between the writing, the drawing, the school visits, the videos you have to film. I would love to do animation, but I, it, it's probably going to have to wait a little while. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like you've got all the tools there to do it, but I can see it's a time. That would be a massive time constraint. Um, just on the school thing, I know there'll be people listening just thinking, actually, this sounds like a really good idea here in the UK as well. I know quite a few children's authors I've spoken to do do children's visits, but to get into this, what advice would you give? First of all, is there, I'm wondering if there's like background checks or bureaucracy involved in, in this. Do you have to go through, jump through a lot of hoops before you start visiting schools? You would think so, right? Right. <laughs> but, but the answer is no. Okay. Uh, no, there is literally nothing. Uh, in fact, uh, they I, I, when school started opening here, again, well, they've been open, but when they started letting me come and have visitors again, it was back in about March. And I assumed that there was going to be a lot of, you know, uh, COVID uh, proof that you would need. I have never shown a card or anything. They've never asked. So the only thing I need is a license. Um, I've never needed to get a background check or anything. What, what um, license? Oh, my driver's license. Oh, just driver's that's, license. Okay. just ID. ID. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just okay. ID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. And in terms of the schools, you say they're kind of basically expecting to hear from authors. Mm -hmm. So you just put something together that says, and you put a presentation together, I guess. Do they need to know much about you to book you or do they? Uh, surprisingly, no, because when I started, right, I didn't have a whole lot of books. I obviously didn't have a reputation. So what I started with was whoever was the nearest to me. Obviously, it's the no brainer, right? I went to the schools that I knew that maybe I knew people at. Um, obviously, like in a lot of professions like this, the first couple I ended up doing for free because I need I needed to learn, too. And I and I just also want to sell some books. Um, but basically, when I was in the beginning, all I would do is I, I always focused on having a pretty good website because I knew that was that was important, that they would, that's how they would take me serious. Um, so I made sure I put a lot of time into the website. Obviously, the presentations, they couldn't know until they actually see me. So that I was working on, but they, that wouldn't help me get work. Um, so the main thing was I was just emailing and phone calls. And even, you know, it's funny, I, I haven't done any international um, virtual author visits, but even like you're saying for authors in the UK, like they can easily do virtual ones. I know the time difference can be a headache at times, but um, there's no limit now. Okay. If you contact schools in America and you say, this is what I do and you have a website and there's nothing that's stopping them from hiring you from here. Yeah. And so what's your plan in the future? The time the school visits are incredible and a key part of your your marketing at the moment but they are a time suck as well um what what do you do in the next two years the truth is honestly is is yeah i they are but honestly i i, I want to do this like this is like you know i i told my wife it's if i have the choice if i could sell a thousand books in a month at a school or a you know ten thousand online and that's i honestly take the thousand at the school because I love the interaction. Like I love being around them. Like um, the, it's boring to me to sell books online because you never see the, the kid that read your book. They don't give you a compliment. Um, also, I didn't mention um, when I, if I was selling online, I'd make a lot less money because you'd have to sell more books to compensate for all the costs that are involved with the cut that goes to all the people you're selling through. Um, when I sell at a school, it's all, it's all for me. There is no cut, right? So, so if I sold through Amazon, they're going to take a portion. So basically I'd have to sell three books for every one book I can sell in a school anyway. So my, my, my two-year plan is to get back to what I had because everything was going great until this thing went down. And then for two years, I was doing all these virtual things and the money wasn't good anymore. And only in the last four or five months, are we starting to get rolling again? So my goal is to first get back to what I was doing and get it back to established and, and doing fine, which should happen because things are getting better here. Um, and then after that, the truth is there are a lot of people that do this 
forever. You know, it's like this is I really do feel like when I did this, I found my calling. Um, and I, I hope I always tell students that J.K. Rowling, I saw in an interview, she said the one thing she misses was author visits and kids because she can't do it anymore. because She's way too famous. Yeah. Um, and I always tell them that I, I hope I never get to that point where I like give up on this. I want to do this my whole life, talking to kids and inspiring them. Yeah, that's great. Um, if people want to have a look at your books, the, the version that's available on Amazon, is that a print on demand version or is that fulfilled from your stock that you have printed? That's that's fulfilled from my stock of um, the best way <clears throat> to, to look at it, because internationally, the best way is on Amazon is to use the ebooks because they're way easier to, to download. They're exactly the same as um, the other books because they get expensive when it goes international. Um, and you can find everything on my website. You can go through there. It's um, the my initials, DJM books.com djmbooks.com um and there's tons of fun stuff there if you want to just check out there's videos and games and projects and all sorts of great things for other authors to learn how i do it and also obviously for kids yeah yeah that's great well daniel you're um you've obviously found like say you found your calling i can feel the enthusiasm for it and uh, i think it's great and it's um it's a lovely way to sell books you know what it is it's like I write kids books. It's a no brainer to me to go meet kids and sell them books and talk about books. It seems like so obvious to me that that's where I would want to be. Yeah. And I hope some uh, children's authors have been inspired to uh, to do the same. So thank you very much indeed for spending your time with us. And people will visit that and uh, take a look at your books. And I'll send you some Giles cartoons when I find them afterwards. Absolutely. That sounds terrific. It's been my pleasure. This is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer there you go really like talking to daniel i mean a very very impressive collection of baseball hats first thing to say i think he has over 300 of them um of course the the teams you know release a new hat every year or so so the fans buy them but i think i think he said he's about 40 short of a complete collection and there aren't many complete collections and they're all unworn apart from one the first one he bought he wore briefly ah but that wasn't, good. wasn't really what we talked about. We talked about mm. his enthusiasm for school visits and how, how he's made that work for him. Uh, very well organized. I thought it was a really interesting, practical takeaway interview for people, particularly publishing children's books in the States. I think you will be uh, uh, motivated by that to go down that route. Um, so your your children's book, which you mentioned just before the interview, Mark, your second one, that is published, is it? I didn't realize that. I thought you were self-publishing it. No, that's uh, another um, joint venture I do with Welbeck. So uh, okay, Welbeck, well, yeah. uh, Alan and I uh, produce the books. Welbeck publishes them. So um, and and gone quite well. I know that all the orders on the second book to the first one that we sold, we, we sold in more books in the second. Uh, first one sold quite strongly, um, which is good. You know, we've got we think we'll do six, and then we'll see where we are. Um, but it's been fun. It's completely yeah. different. Um, way of looking at things obviously illustrations of the book is you know kind of it's holding up the screen now you have it, you know, illustrations throughout the book right. so it's, it's very different from the adult books that i do um and also lovely to get you know getting fan mail from young readers the same age as my kids which is, is really nice and around world book day had some people dressing up as the characters and all that it's it is it's it's quite fulfilling and doing school visits i mean that, that was fun you know I, I don't have the time to do too many of them um but it's really nice to kind of leave kids with a message that this is, you know, not just talking about the book itself and how it was written and how, and how it was put together, but to leave them inspired that they can also do, they could write themselves. Um, and it's uh, it's a legitimate career choice now in a way that it wasn't when I was um, when I was at school. So, yeah, all, good all around, really. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, look, when we um when we record the episode, looking back at the show after the show, I'll also talk about the launch of my second book, which um I'm in the middle of at the moment, but it doesn't actually launch on Kindle until, um, funnily enough, the first day of the show on Tuesday, the twenty eighth. But I can tell you, I've had my first orange tag for hitting number one in a category in America, and then f- quickly followed the next day by my second, uh, both in the states. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how specifically I drove those sales because I think they came from one source, um, which I think might be of interest to people. We'll, we'll go through that as part of the uh, look back at the show as it's sort of tied in uh, time-wise to that. 
Good. I think that's it, Mark. We can take a little breather now. Uh, lots going on. Obviously, a very busy week ahead for us um, because, again, we're recording this just before the show. But uh, next time you hear from us, it will be after and we'll probably stop banging on about it. We'll be banging on about the show in 2023 by then. So that's it for me. OK, you can go back to your sneezing. Uh, all that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.